Hello, Tarzan. Okay. I was mumbling something about being happy to be here. <laughs> and you know, that becomes quite a trite phase anyway when you're from the Pentagon, from Washington, especially these days if you're a member of the government. Uh, you're happy to be anywhere other than Washington. But really, I am, because as I was saying, it's the, the home university for Lou Thompson, who is the executive, the executive military assistant to the assistant secretary of defense, Jerry Friedheim. Lou is standing right over in the door there, one of your sons of this university, and an outstanding professional in our business. And of course, my uh, military assistant, uh, Commander Larry Hamilton, is also a native Iowan. And we have even another member of what we call our Iowa Mafia in the Department of Defense Public Affairs, uh, Marv Bremen. So we are well set with Iowans. <clears throat> but I came here to talk to you today, and I'll get right into it. Not too long, but a little bit informative, I think, I hope, on what is necessary now to firm up the peace and to make it a matter of fact and a lasting condition in this country, because I think that's what the majority of the people in this country are concerned about right now. And that is the quality of the peace that we have finally gained in Southeast Asia. And that is the reason that we can clearly understand why many are looking unconsciously, around, uncomfortably around them at the signs of continuing strife in Southeast Asia and in other parts of the world, wondering, are we off to another one again so soon? I would like to calm those fears because I don't believe we are off to another one. I think that the generation of peace that this president has promised to the American people is here. I think that we are at the threshold, definitely, of the generation of peace and we would like to ensure that for you. But it is necessary that you understand what is still necessary to be done to ensure that generation. I have spent much of my time in the three years and a couple of months that I've been back in the Department of Defense in this capacity as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense concerned with public affairs, informing the American people. That's what public affairs is all about. Informing the people of this country on how the Defense Department does its business and what we're about and why. <clears throat> as a necessary adjunct to this, uh, I had an additional duty to communicate with young people. And this was laid on by then Secretary of Defense Melvin R. Laird, and it has been a continued requirement under the secretaryship of Elliot L. Richardson, and I'm sure it will be under the new secretary when he takes his seat. Because we are concerned about communicating with young people, and so we'd like to get out and talk to them in their natural habitat, and you find most of them these days, fortunately, in the, in the college and university campuses and in the high school auditoriums around our country. And I feel that this is where the biggest battleground exists, as it has for the past generation, and generations before, for that matter. The biggest battle of the past generation has not been fought on the battlefields in Southeast Asia, but rather in the minds of our young people, the battle for the minds of these young people. And the antagonists have been, on both sides, on one side, those people who have given up on society and are determined that the only way to make it responsive to their needs is to tear it down and tear down its institutions physically, if need be, and build them again in the mold that they would have them. On the other side are the people who feel that the way to solve whatever is wrong with the society as it is presently structured in our country is to become a part of its institutions and rebuild from within or influence the decisions and the policy that makes it work as it must. I stand with the latter crowd. I am a member of the establishment. I freely accept that. 
I am a part of the power structure, if you wish to call it that. I make no excuses for that. We realize in defense that we are not necessarily the most popular kids on the block, and we haven't been for some time. We make no apologies for that, because our job is not necessarily to be popular, but to be strong and to be capable of and willing to carry out our responsibilities to defend and protect our nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that's what we have to do. And we accept that obligation freely. Now, I come from a part of the country that has been noted for giving a certain segment of the citizenry of this society, notably the black minority, a sort of short shrift in the exercise of their rights and the realizations of their dreams in a true democracy, the Deep South. I was born and reared in Pensacola, Florida, about as deep south as you can possibly get. And in my travels and going around to communicate and speak to young people, I arrived at a point <coughs> of departure, or progression, if you would, to speak to the young people that I was talking to in my hometown one night by reviewing to them a little bit of the early history of my life. And I found it a good place to start from because it kind of let them know that I was no hothouse plant and that I had known the hot breaths of hatred based strictly on racial origin. I was down in Pensacola that particular night to speak to the graduation, graduating class of Catholic High School, the largest high school in my hometown. And I had been invited there to do that after a, I spoke to a group of wives and families of the League of Families of Prisoners of War and Missing in Action in Southeast Asia. And so I arrived at the city auditorium that night, not much in the mood to give a speech, because I was sort of downcast because I hadn't been able to answer the questions of those ladies whose loved ones were languishing in prison camps under very tough conditions in Southeast Asia, and many of them were missing and we haven't found them yet. But leaving that place, I knew that I hadn't been able to answer their questions, not even to my satisfaction, let alone theirs, because the other side hadn't seen fit to give me the answers. <laughs> they weren't operating by the Geneva Conventions at all. And that was the reason I had to travel around a lot to try to administer to the needs of these ladies and try to answer some of their questions. But leaving there that night to go speak to that high school audience, I didn't feel very much in the mood to give a high school graduating address because, you see, I wasn't too far removed from high school to remember what a climate that was and what a happy day high school graduation is. You know, you, you expect the speaker to come in because this is one of the most important plateaus that these young people will reach in their young lives. And they accept the speaker sort of as a necessary evil. He, he's expect, they'll tolerate him for a while, and he's expected to stand up there and be a little bit profound and uh, maybe a little bit humorous, but above all, very short. Uh, they don't want to sit around too long because the big event is the graduating party and dance afterwards. And that's the big event where you get out and uh, <clears throat> get dad's car back home without a scratch if you're lucky and cheap death. So I expected to meet those criteria, but in my present mood, I didn't know whether I could or not. But then I reasoned not to worry because these affairs always have a valedictorian and a salutatorian, and, and these young people always have a real great message of hope and faith and sick them and go out there and, and beat the world. And I said, I'll get my charge and my spirit from these two young people when they make their speeches tonight, then I'll be able to give these young people the kind of address they should have. But then I was taken back again when the young man who was running the festivities, the president of the senior class, got up and said, uh, tonight we're going to depart from the usual. Uh, we are not going to have a valedictorian or a salutatorian to make a speech. He said, instead, we're going to share with you a responsive reading. It's a kind of dialogue. And we wrote it ourselves, and it expresses our hopes and our aspirations and our fears, and it points out to you the challenges that we expect to face in life and the way we're going to meet and beat these challenges. 
this. And so I figured, okay, that's fine. This, this, they said they wrote it themselves, and this will give me the kind of spirit I need to enter into this talk. And so I settled back to listen and to read my part. But when we started out, I, I was really concerned because it started out quite dark indeed. It said, our world is dark. We live in a dark world. The road of life is bumpy and rough, and we are forced to travel this road. The sea of life is stormy, and we are on this sea, and our boat is rocking and leaky. I sat here a few short months ago, they said, with some young people who have since gone away to fight a strange war in a strange land, and many of them don't believe in this conflict, and many of these won't return to us at all. I live in constant fear myself of being atomized before my time by some strange weapon of war that man has made to annihilate man. The population is exploding. Two-thirds of the world is hungry, they intoned. And I was just thinking, my God, how deep do we dive before we climb here? And what a gloomy set this is. When a little bit further along, they sounded the note that I was looking for. They said, but we, the class of 1970, we will not despair. We accept the challenge to create constructive change in our time. And we will do this working within the established system of laws in this land of laws of ours. And we'll do this by working within the system to become a part of it. Now, we might have to change some of those laws because some of them we don't consider just and we certainly don't agree with the method by which they are applied now because we don't feel that they are applied equally to the benefit and protection of all of our citizens. But we'll change that too if we have to. As one of our great presidents once said, they intoned, the buck stops here. We've got it, America. Step out of the way. We'll take care of it from here on in. And I thought, how great, how grand. This is precisely what I was looking for. And how great to hear it from the mouths of some so young. And I could hardly wait then to get to that mic to tell them that they had reason to have such hope and especially such faith in their ability to create such constructive change within the system. And I did. I said, my young friends, if I were to recite for you a soliloquy to parallel your dialogue based on my growing up in this very southern town here, Pensacola, in my formative years that I spent on Alconey Street, it would sound just as dark as yours in the beginning. Because you see, I lived on the other end of Alconey Street, past Blunt Street. The governor comes from the other. And my end of Alconey Street, past Blunt, wasn't a very bright place in those days. It was a place that would become known in larger cities in later years by a fancy name called a ghetto. Well, we had no such fancy name for it. We called it just precisely what it was, a miserable place to live, and some other names that I couldn't share with you in polite society. But that's where I grew up. And if I wrote a soliloquy to parallel your dialogue on the other end of Alcony Street, it would sound just as dark as yours, I told him. I said it would say, my street is dark. I live on a dark street. My street is dark because my end of the street doesn't have any street lights. The street lights stop where the white folks stop, four blocks up the street at Blunt. My road is bumpy and rough. My road is bumpy and rough because my end of the road doesn't have any pavement. The pavement stops where the white folks live, four blocks up the street at Blunt. I am dark. I'm black. I was born that way. I had no choice in the matter. It just happens to be the way I arrived. There seemed to be a lot of people in this town at that time who took a weird delight in reminding me that at least in their minds that made me somehow different and relegated me to a certain position in life that I should readily accept, they said, called, quote, my place, unquote. And I was to remember to stay in my place if I wanted to get along or even to survive, some of them said, and they had some pretty harsh ways of demonstrating this at the end of a rope, totally unpunished. There were beautiful parks in that town, green grass in the parks, and benches in those parks. But the benches were labeled colored and white. And to make sure that I didn't sit on the wrong one, they were painted black and white. 
the latrine doors colored white, the water fountains colored white, the waiting rooms themselves colored white, the buses white colored to the rear. Everywhere I looked, this built-in inferiority complex for a young black lad growing up in that town was everywhere evident. I walked past two beautiful high schools, three beautiful high schools every day, two and a half miles across town to my raggedy, ill-kemp, substandard one to get my substandard education. Two-thirds of the world is hungry? Hell, I was hungry. I was hungry for knowledge and a little understanding and a bit of opportunity that was equal and just a little bit of brotherly love. That's all I was asking. But I was led to believe that I shouldn't even expect or ask for that. But I was not without hope or faith. And that's where I climbed because, you see, I had on my side two of the greatest things that a young man or woman could possibly have who finds himself in such a predicament. And that was a set of parents, a mother and a dad, that didn't know the meaning of the words give up, and they taught it to me right quick. They said, my son, for you there is a challenge here that you must not give up on until you defeat it. Remember that for you there is an eleventh commandment, learn it well and practice it and it dictates thou shall not quit. Now you get out there, and don't you dare sacrifice your abilities on the dubious altar of despair. You take advantage of what meager opportunity is afforded you here under this totally unfair system, and you develop it to develop your power of individual excellence. The power of excellence was my main subject at my mother's knee from the time I can remember. She said, you climb, using the power of your own individual excellence. It's the only power on earth worth your investing in. Can you develop it? It's a power that is recognized and appreciated all over the world. It's a staple whose value never decreases, and everybody reaches out to employ it and embrace it, and nobody questions its color. So you get it and use it to climb your way up to the top of whatever your chosen profession might be, and you let your contribution to the effort to free your people in this land be a byproduct of what you achieve in your chosen field. And you'll find when you get on top with authority that you can exert more influence from up there to solve what's wrong down there than you can from under the bottom with a brick or a torch or a sign, so get up there and participate. Perform, participate, excel, excel, lead. Those are the words I came up by. And it wasn't easy and it wasn't fair. And I wouldn't want my kids to have to walk such a prejudiced, unfair, limiting way. And that's why I stuck with the establishment because I have got something in the establishment that's mine it is a part of my birthright. And when I heard the angry cries as we came along from some people who said, if you niggas don't like it here, why don't you go back to Africa? I said, hell, I didn't come from there. United States of America, 1606 North Alcony Street, that's my home, and I abdicate my citizenship to nobody. This is mine right here. This is my country, and I love her well, and if she's got ills, I'll hold her hand until working together we can put them straight and to those who say, if you don't do it my way, I'll burn it down, I say, like hell you will, I got too much invested in it. And I suggest to the young people of today, of all colors and creeds, so have you. We're going to solve what's wrong with it. All is not right. We have made a lot of progress in the past decade and the decade before it. We have not completed the task. We've still got another mile to run toward equality for all of our citizens. But I say we have a better track to run it on now, and we can make better time, and I'm just trying to get the young people of this country to stay in the race and to pull together to solve what remains to be solved, rather than pulling separately and going back into that the dark days of separatism and polarization, which is self-limiting at best. And the rewards are many at the finishing line. Now, why am I talking to you about that? 
because that is a big problem that still remains to be solved in the unity of this country. There have been a lot of wounds that have been opened by a long war that lasted far too long for any of our citizens. There were many it didn't escape leaving its mark on any separate race, creed, or color, or section of the block in this country. And there were a lot of sores that still fester, and a lot of mistrust that has been fed and nurtured by other problems that have been in the forefront lately. But we are moving quickly to solve these, and we can only solve them by shoring up and modifying the greatest weapon that we have in our arsenal. And that weapon isn't a physical weapon, mind you. It's a psychological one. It's a weapon called unity. Unity in the principles of democracy held together by the rivets of togetherness that we must have to show any potential enemy or real one participating at this time. That we cannot be skillfully divided within our own midst so that he has an easy chance of taking advantage of us or our friends. There are many who fear our treaties with our friends and our foreign policy concerning this. But this country doesn't exist in a vacuum. It never has. It can't. And the answer to whether or not we have another conflict doesn't exist in isolation. We have always depended for our mutual security on our pacts and our treaties and our word with our friends around the country, around the world. And we're not trying to be the cop on every beat anymore. We have very quietly drawn down our physical presence throughout the globe. And we plan to continue to do that. We have served notice through the Nixon Doctrine to our friends around the world that we don't plan to get physically involved anymore if we can help it. We will try to help them defend themselves by providing them the means and the will to do so. The means, the will is up to them. But we are not going to try to beat the rap by copping out on our friends either. Because in partnership lies that strength that makes our hardware and the men and women of our armed sources a realistic deterrent. Those things together, working together, in full view of the international community, provides the kind of atmosphere that prevents wars. And then maybe we can possibly get back or get around to the promise of beating our swords into plowshares. But it must begin here at home. That's where it started to come apart. Now, make no mistake about the fact, and any potential enemy shouldn't make this mistake either, that we are going to scrap our armed forces. It's not that kind of climate yet. Far from it. We've got to be able to bargain from a position of strength. And when all else fails, the world must know that before we give up anything that is germane to the security of this country and her people, that if fight we must, fight we shall. There are young men like my son and myself, I speak for us, who will not turn our obligations over in this regard to anybody else. I proudly state that he is a captain in the Air Force and fought his part in the last conflict. And he's basically a lover. He doesn't want to have to fight again. He's a young bachelor. But he won't turn around and run and hide if it comes time. And he doesn't have any sympathy with those who did or do. And that's the way we feel about it. This is our nation, and everybody must be prepared to do his share in time of peace to prevent the time of war. And if he carries out this job in the proper manner, and it becomes obvious to those who would stand against us, and our friends, then we may circumvent the necessity. Then we may indeed be on the threshold of that generation of peace that the President has promised. And we in the military want to make that an eternity of peace. You see, there's a mistaken idea among a lot of people that military men love to fight and shoot and get shot at. 
Nothing could be farther than the truth. Nobody dislikes war worse than warriors. And to the peacenik who shouted in my ear, peace now, freedom now, I said, you've got no corner on that market, friend. Nobody dislikes war worse than warriors. We're the ones that have to get shot at and too often die for the objectives that we pursue. We want an eternity of peace, but we will not have it at anybody else's terms. It must be with the security of our nation, firmly in mind, and that must be foremost. And that's just the way it is. Now, we can get on with the generation of peace. If you'll get on to fixing that weapon called unity, stop finding so many ways to hate each other because of race, creed, religion, social strata, section of the block, political party, or what's your excuse today? Get it together. Kids sing a song about getting it together. They say it's going to take a little more time to get it together. There's been a whole lot of people been working to get it together like you and me who are determined that every man's going to be free, but it's just going to take a little more time to get it together. And I ask you to stick together while we put it together. We're working very hard to do this, and there's progress being made. And as I rumble to the close of this address, I point to that progress and ask that everybody assess it when you become uptight about what's still wrong. Look how far we've moved to solve what's wrong in all other areas. In the personal area that I mentioned to you before, the area of equality, my people will look at it with clear eyes. We can see how far we've come since my days of growing up on Alconee Street. There are no more segregated schools or buses in that town. Alconee Street is paved all the way through and it's lit all the way down. The benches in those parks are painted green like the grass. And all of the citizens of my community sit on them and discuss other ways to improve it. There are black people as well as white people on the city council in increasing numbers. And even the signs on those latrine doors now just say men and women for social purpose. We've come a long way there and all around this land of ours, and we continue to progress. And I say to the angry black young militant, I say don't tear it down. You've got to be receptive. There are a lot of hands reaching out in friendship and down in help to pull you up today. And many of these hands are white. Reach out toward them. Don't brush them aside because they find it pretty hard to grasp a hole in friendship or in help if your hands ball tightly into a fist of hate. That's part of the getting it together that I'm talking about. Don't crawl back under that separate but equal blanket. I was under there once, and I always found it very separate and never equal self-defeating, self-limiting, and un-American as it can be. Reverse racism will not work any more than the original kind did. Bigotry is ugly no matter what the color of the beamer. And I say to my young black friends, reach out. The opportunity is going to be equal this time. The people are going to be receptive. You don't have to burn it down to get their attention anymore. But I say to the white majority in the same breath, don't you make me a liar. You make sure it is equal. That's the only way to fly. Because that's the only thing that's going to work in this great nation of ours. And that's the only thing that will prove in the eyes of the world that we practice what we preach. You may shout, God bless America, as much as you want. But unless you live it by the way you treat your neighbors and your friends, and by your own personal preferences, it's a hollow phrase, and America will not be blessed by it. But the other side and the only way to go is for you to develop that unity. And don't just sit there and say, I'm not a part of the question that you described, General. I didn't light the torch. I didn't throw the brick. I didn't start the riot. I didn't disrupt the campus. I didn't call my brother honky. I didn't call my brother nigger. Did you tell a dummy who did he's wrong? you have the courage and the guts to do that? Or did you kind of sit there and act like you didn't hear it and say it happened down the block? It's not my problem. If you did, you're a part of the problem, my friend, because you see, then he counts you in his own biased, bigoted camp. 
silent majority of hell, stand up and be counted for what you believe in and get in there and help solve the problem. Responsible involvement is what it's called and it's your responsibility and mine. So I challenge you today to build for yourselves by the way you live your daily lives and try to influence all of those with whom you come in contact to build for themselves, their link and your link in that chain that is the unity that has always preceded the states of America and made her strong, the United States of America, and show that unity to the world and they won't stand against us. And maybe they will listen to us in our cry for peace in our time. And maybe they will believe that we don't want to study war no more. And then and only then will we all truly, in God standing together, overcome. Thanks for listening. General James, I hope you can see by the round of applause how much we appreciate it for sharing your thoughts and your experiences with us. Uh, this afternoon, we still do have a few more activities on for you. The departmental open houses will be open for one more hour yet. I would suggest that you stop down at the information booth here in the Union on your way out and check and see what you might like to do for the rest of the day. Thank you very much for coming.